Do we need to still shelter in place? No. Do we need businesses to be shut down? No. The last thing we want to do is to rush to reopen America haphazardly. Hello and welcome to The Nexus. Is it time to end the lockdown? Many of us would prefer to stay at home rather than risk getting the coronavirus, but there are plenty of people out there too who would argue we need to get back to work and back to normal. Take these two doctors in California, for example. They say they have the data to prove the lockdown's been a total waste of time and does more harm than good. A video of them presenting their findings got over 5 million views on YouTube before the site took it down. They were censored for contradicting local health authority guidelines. Their advice deemed too dangerous even to be heard. Well, we hear from one of the doctors, Dr. Dan Erickson, in a moment. And we'll get a second opinion from Dr. Andrew Neumer, who's an epidemiologist also in California. But first of all, a quick look at how the story broke. I call my two local doctors to reopen our economy and lift California's stay-at-home orders has gained a lot of national attention of late. We've seen 1,227 deaths in the state of California. That means you have a 0.03 chance of dying from COVID-19 in the state of California. Does that necessitate sheltering in place? Does that necessitate shutting down medical systems? Does that necessitate people being out of work? Doctors Dan Erickson and Artin Masihi own Accelerated Urgent Care. That's the largest coronavirus testing site in Kern County. ER doctors now, my friends that I talk to say, you know, it's interesting, when I'm, when I'm writing up my death report, I'm being pressured to add COVID. Why is that? To maybe increase the numbers and make it look a little bit worse than it is? I think so. Do we need to still shelter in place? Emphatically, no. Do we need businesses to be shut down? Emphatically, no. Their press conference last Wednesday has drawn a lot of criticism. The American College of Emergency Physicians and the American Academy of Emergency Medicine has some issues with what you've said. It appears these two individuals are releasing biased, non-peer-reviewed data to advance their personal financial interests without regard for the public's health. What do you say? The collateral damage to shutting down an economy has to be considered. You have to balance the collateral damage with the, with the medical illness and say which one has a worse effect on society. The two doctors presented a flurry of data pointing to what we are currently learning about this virus and how it spreads. Last night, the doctor's video, the one you just saw, was pulled off of YouTube. YouTube, they're saying to us, uh, we're going to tell you what's true. And if you dare go against what we say is true, not necessarily what is true, but what we say is true, then we're going to boot you. Well, let's bring in our guests now. And we have one of the doctors featured in that report, Dr. Dan Erickson. And we also have an epidemiologist from the same state, California, uh, Dr. Andrew Neumer, who's also an associate professor at the University of California. Dr. Erickson, I would like to start with you. Just introduce yourself to our viewers. Um, how long have you been a doctor? And what kinds of clinics do you run then in California? I've been a doctor 16 years and I run urgent care centers, which are kind of a step down from the hospital. So people are, you know, people are walking, you know, broken legs, cut arms, pneumonia, all types of different disease processes we see at seven different clinics. Now, you've been criticized by uh, many in your profession. You've been censored by YouTube. What's motivating you here? Why are you sticking your neck out and, and giving advice that is contrary to the prevailing official advice? This is non-randomized data. So I, I collected this basic data and was letting the, 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 the local uh, media know what was going on because they had asked me. And I, I, I anticipated a small press conference with about three minutes of news coverage. And then they told me, oh, no, we're going live on Facebook. I don't, I'm, I don't do social media. So I didn't know what that necessarily meant. And then all of a sudden, I'm on TV shows in London. So th this is not what I planned for. And my advice, really, I wasn't countering. What I was saying is it's time to pivot. After two months of towing the line to answer your question, I, I wore the PPE. My family wore it. We wore it to the store. I spent thousands on protective equipment. I, I set up a COVID testing site. I, I went all in for two months. And after I saw the numbers, and then I looked at California, and I called my colleagues in the ER, and I talked to two epidemiologists and a biostatistician, they were all telling me, 
maybe it's time to pivot. Maybe the models in different countries might have something to teach us from South Korea and Sweden. Okay, well, let's take a look at your data that you gathered firsthand. You tested 5,213 people at the time of that uh, press conference. You found 340, or 6.5% of them, tested positive for COVID. And you then concluded it was very widespread, similar to the flu. And what a lot of people are asking is, how can you extrapolate from that sample to the, the wider population when you consider that the people coming there for tests would have either had symptoms or suspected that they had been in contact with people who had COVID-19? Initially, the CDC asked us to screen for cough, fever, and shortness of breath, which we did. So that's non-randomized. People were coming in for suspected symptoms. However, about three weeks into it, the, the uh, local business owners said, hey, by the way, I'm sending 500 people over. They have no symptoms. We, we had one person with a fever on one shift that they weren't even exposed to, but we're testing everyone. So the data started to get more randomized. People started coming in saying, hey, I have an elderly grandmother. Can you test me? I have no symptoms and neither does she. I have an immune compromised child. Can you test me? I just want to know if I have it. The data, the data started to get more and more randomized as we went on. It didn't start out that way. OK. And this OK. So a portion of, of your, of your um, patients, if you like, were randomized. They weren't coming in with the symptoms. So let's look at your figures for the entire state of California then. At the time of the news conference, the state had tested 280,900 people and found that around 12% of them had tested positive for COVID-19. You then extrapolated that result to the whole of California's population and deduced that 4.7 million people had already been infected. Here's your conclusion at the time as to what that meant for the death rate. We've seen 1,227 deaths in the state of California with a possible uh, incidence or prevalence of 4.7 million. That means you have a 0.03 chance of dying from COVID-19 in the state of California. 0.03 chance of dying from COVID in the state of California. Now, Dr. Erickson, I've spoken to other doctors in your state, and they say that they were requested to initially test people with symptoms. So they would object to your conclusion. They would say, of course, it's going to be a higher rate of, of positive cases. It doesn't make any sense for you to draw these conclusions. Well, I, I, again, I'm going, to, I'm going to defer to some of the other studies in California. Did you read the uh, California serology study from Stanford? 3,300 tests. Now, they used a serology test, which is immunoglobulin, and they found up to 4.16% of people in the county of Santa Clara indeed had the disease, which would mean 50 to 80,000 people whereas the health department reported 956. And they said, we're, we're, we're predicting 50 to 80,000 cases. So they were way off. And what we were seeing was the early models were predicting 2.2 million deaths. So we were, there was a lot of, there was a lot of uh, predictive models that were speculating. And so I was basically saying, this is my raw data. This is not biostatistically analyzed. This is not randomized. This is not peer reviewed. It is raw data to give some balance to the, the, the 2.2 million deaths that we were hearing coming from yeah, our top but, doctors in the country. But then again, you have to take into account that these social distancing measures might have had the desired effect. And then later in your press conference, you wanted to draw a comparison between California and Norway, which have had lockdowns, to Sweden, uh, which didn't have a lockdown, although they had some, some measures. Uh, let's have another listen to that press conference. When you bring up a system of lockdown, you automatically have to compare it to a system of no lockdown. They did a little bit of social distancing. They would wear masks and separate. They went to schools. Stores were open. They were almost about their normal daily life with a little bit of social distancing. They had how many deaths? 1,765. California's had 1,220 with isolation. No isolation. 1,765. We have more people. What I'm getting at is millions of cases, very small death. Okay, so Dr. Erickson, the impression you're giving is that Sweden really wasn't much worse off, even though it didn't have a lockdown. But if we just look at the numbers that you gave during the press conference, you can see that Sweden has a far higher rate of infection, around 21%. 
versus 12% in California, 4.9% in neighboring Norway, uh, which also had a lockdown, and something like five times more deaths per million than California and Norway. So I find it uh, surprising that you would say the Swedish model is one to follow for the United States. Actually, it's not surprising at all. When you have an open country, open schools, open businesses, of course you're going to have a higher death rate. Our deaths are occurring earlier in Sweden. As you flatten the curve, as you lengthen the cycle, the deaths happen later because we're, we're hovering in our homes. So you have to understand, this is Dr. Gesecki, Dr. Anders Tegnell saying, yeah, we're going to have a little higher death rate now. We're not like Norway that's on total lockdown and people aren't interacting. There's no martial law going on. Kids are in school. Businesses are open. People are, are limiting groups of less than 50, but they're still going to restaurants. Yes, you're going to have a spike earlier. If you look at Wuhan, China or South Korea, these groups didn't isolate and they got to their herd immunity in about four weeks. And we're, we're going to get to herd immunity over a longer period of time because we're isolating. So you have to understand that the deaths come at a different rate based on whether you isolate or don't isolate. Andrew Neumann, what do you make of the Swedish approach? Is that one you would have advocated for the United States? No, I, uh, I, I don't uh, think the Swedish approach is prudent. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, everyone, many people, including the president of the United States, have criticized the Swedish approach. Sweden has the highest death rate in the, uh, Benelo in the uh, Scandinavian and, and Nordic countries. I mean, you know, Sweden and Norway is a really stark comparison. Sweden and Finland is a stark comparison. Those are the two neighbors of Sweden. You, you know, it's, it's hard to find the sweet spot. We, all these countries need to find the right balance between absolute lockdown and absolute freedom. And I, I think Sweden has, has erred on this too much on the side of freedom, which is a costly decision. Mm. Yeah. Look, the, the point uh, of the lockdown, as Dr. Erickson mentioned, is to flatten the curve. And this buys time for people to find better treatments, to get to a vaccine, and to make sure that hospitals are not overwhelmed with the sick. Uh, so, you know, D Dr. Neumann, presumably you support having a lockdown, at least so far. Well, I mean, I think this, this might be an area where Dr. Erickson and I ag agree a, a bit. So we, we need to lock down for the reasons you suggested, but we cannot lock down indefinitely until a vaccine is, is available. We cannot just stay on lockdown for 15 months. That it's not practical, people won't do it. You know, pandemic comes from the ancient Greek word demic, which means people, upon people. And we need to remember that this is not just a virus, but there's people involved. And we don't want to hurt welfare you know, more through our actions than the virus is hurting our welfare. So we do need to lock down to keep the hospitals functioning so we don't have like a Northern Italy situation in American hospitals. But we, I, I, I am not an advocate of absolute lockdown and doing nothing else but locking down until a vaccine comes. That's not going to work. Yeah. We need to start isn't, reopening. Isn't there a, somebody mentioned sweet spot earlier, isn't there a sort of Goldilocks uh, formula here? either of you, uh, where you have a lockdown of the, the more vulnerable groups in society and the, the rest go back to work and take their chances. I think you have to look at what happened to the hospitals during lockdown. I called three CEOs in the area and their census was down significantly. Their ICU beds were open. Their ERs were slow. They had furloughed doctors. They had furloughed nurses. So this, this thing we were trying to do has... That, that was supposed to decrease our, our hospitals, we prepared for bear and squirrel showed up in California. So we have all these resources being underutilized and, and now we're prepared for a second wave. And I asked the hospitals, are you, are you prepared for a second wave, which we see during influenza? They said, yes, we are. You know, when we get busy, we put tents in the parking lot, we expand our scope of care, but laying off physicians and nurses is no way to prepare. So I think the biggest question that I think I would ask YouTube and the rest of these people we need to answer is, is the collateral damage of COVID causing more depression, anxiety, suicide, and alcoholism? Is Are the medical uh, negative effects of the collateral damage of COVID indeed worse than treating the illness itself?
We're running out of time now, so let's just get to the question of censorship, uh, Dr. Erickson. Your video was taken down by YouTube after it was watched five million times. Uh, they say that you contravened local health authority guidelines. And I, I wanted to ask you, you know, if you think that's a fair point or if you think you've been unfairly censored. I think getting the, getting the best truth out there comes from us debating as physicians what needs to go forward. And I think squelching people's First Amendment rights is never a way to get the best answer out of our people. I think the best approach is to get a physician panel like we have today and say, let's go over the best ideas to move forward. Instead of squelching anyone who maybe has a little different opinion, why don't we get all the opinions together you know, and, and, and see what the best one is. Let's look at Sweden. Let's look at South Korea. Let's talk to epidemiologists like the gentleman we have on today. Let's pool our ideas and make a great decision instead of just stomping on someone's First Amendment rights and saying you don't have the right to your opinion. Dr. Neumer, a final answer from you. What is your view on dissenting opinions being censored on social media on the pretext, uh, or at least for the reason, that potentially they're going to cost lives if they if they're allowed out there. Well, it's it's a tough question. I mean, I have some areas of agreement with your other guest, Dr. Erickson. He and I disagree on some other things. I participate in social media on Twitter, where I interact with people who have a wide spectrum of views, and I I think in general, you know, if we can all open our minds, uh, then we can come to something close to a consensus, but only if we talk to one another. Dr. Andrew Neumer, Dr. Dan Erickson, thank you very much, both of you, for your contributions to the Nexus. We're going to stay on the issue of censorship now. And as we know, the CEO of YouTube has recently said that any content that contradicts World Health Organization guidelines will be taken down from their site. Anything that is medically unsubstantiated, so people saying like, take vitamin C, um, you know, um, take turmeric, like those are all will cure you. Um, those are the examples of things that would be a violation of our policy. Um, anything that would go against World Health Organization recommendations would be a violation of our policy. And so remove is another really important part of our mm. policy. Now, some Americans, of course, find this favoritism towards YouTube rather galling especially when you consider that their president and others have accused the WHO of covering up for China's mistakes. We want them to be transparent. Parroting Beijing's line that there was no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission, advising us not to wear face masks except when we're sick, even as more and more experts around the world dismissed that advice, and opposing travel restrictions even on countries experiencing a coronavirus outbreak even as Chinese travelers unwittingly flew the virus around the world. There is no reason for measures that unnecessarily interfere with international travel and trade. OK, let's bring in our last two guests now. They're from different sides of the political aisle, uh, but both believe that YouTube got this latest censorship decision wrong. Uh, on the left there, we have Matt Binder, a tech and politics journalist with Mashable, and on the right, we have Brandon Strzok, an influencer who uses his online platform to support President Trump. Uh, now, Brandon, as we've just been hearing, YouTube, its CEO, has said it will take down content that contradicts World Health Organization recommendations, including uh, the doctor's video. Why do you have a problem with that? The big problem that I have is whether it be Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, any of these tech giants who tend to be very, very liberal in their point of views. A lot of them are major supporters of the Democrat Party, and they are making decisions on behalf of all people. What is truthful information? What is relevant information? And what is particularly, I think, problematic about this latest case with coronavirus and the YouTube uh, video from the doctors with the information, the uh, immunologists, is that the information that we've gotten surrounding coronavirus has changed on an almost daily basis. There is nobody who knows for sure what the accurate and correct information is surrounding coronavirus, uh, the number of cases, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea that YouTube has the right to tell all of us what we can and can't know and what is accurate, important, mm. truthful information surrounding coronavirus is, I think, completely unacceptable. Matt, if I could just come to you, uh, one thing that Brandon didn't say explicitly, but uh, that you know he alluded to, was that the YouTube and other social media platforms 
uh, is actually impinging on Americans, uh, you know, First Amendment rights, the rights to free speech. Uh, what's the, the legal situation there? Well, well, the truth is that Google isn't a government entity, so they are not, uh, by law, have to abide by the First Amendment. They simply are a private company. They could do what they feel uh, is right uh, in terms of taking this content down. Now, I don't agree in this specific case that they should have taken this content down. YouTube has uh, various ways to basically note that this information uh, is not 100% accurate. They can also put uh, videos, uh, recommended videos refuting these two doctors. I don't think this is as harmful as misinformation where someone is saying, uh, hey, drink bleach to fight off the coronavirus, where someone can actually just directly die from that. Uh, so, you know, whether the decision was right or not, it was still their call to make, and they have the right to make that call. That's not entirely true. And this is a debate that, you know, we're having in this country with a lot of different social media platforms. It's the question of, are they a publisher or are they a platform? Now, a lot of these, uh, Facebook, for instance, YouTube, they would argue that they are platforms, but as platforms, they legally should not have the right to go in and alter content, remove content, censor content, because that is what a publisher does. And if they want to consider themselves publishers, then they're going to be uh, under a lot more scrutiny for the content that they put out, and they're going to open themselves up to a lot more lawsuits, which, of course, they don't want to do. So the idea that it's so simple and cut and dry that, oh, they're a public company so they can do whatever they want, that's not exactly how it works. I mean, we know that the, the phone companies are private companies, but they can't uh, shut off your phone service if they don't like what you're saying or if they find that you're uh, spreading rumors or incorrect information over the phone. That's not how this works. We, we, we could debate this for quite some time, but I need to go over a bit more ground, uh, including what Facebook is doing. Now, they kept the video of the doctors up, uh, but they have censored other content related to coronavirus. For example, uh, Facebook doesn't allow uh, users to, to use their accounts to organize anti-lockdown marches uh, where they contravene official guidelines. Here's Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg explaining that one. So how do you deal with the fact that Facebook is now being used to, to organize a lot of these protests to defy social distancing, defy the social distancing guidelines in states? Is somebody trying to organize something like that, does that qualify as harmful information we do classify that as harmful misinformation and we take that down now brandon you've attended uh, one of these marches i believe you're going to go on another one again facebook uh, would categorize them as harmful misinformation because when these marches occur for example they the people there don't maintain safe social distancing measures um he has a fair point doesn't he this Michigan rally that I attended most recently, which was last week, is a prime example of what you're talking about, because that was actually a rally that was planned on Facebook. Uh, at one point, they had 20,000 people set, uh, signed up to come to this rally. Facebook removed the, the post about the rally. They created a second post, which garnered about three or 4,000 people, and Facebook removed that as well for the very reasons that you just said. Is it a fair point? I don't know. You tell me. I got out on six airplanes, three going there and three going back. I stood in a crowd of 1,000 people in the pouring, freezing rain, which is a prime breeding ground for coronavirus. I'm healthy as a horse, and so are all of the people who was there at that rally. They're coming, so, Matt, what's the um, problem? Have this, you been tested? Have you been tested, Brandon? I, I'm, I wouldn't be tested because I don't have any symptoms. Right. I feel you can be an asymptomatic carrier of this. You can, be, you can be an asymptomatic carrier of this, killing people as you go to all these things, as you infect them with coronavirus. We don't, we okay. don't know. Now I'm responsible know. for murder because I went out and exercised my First Amendment right. I now have to feel I mean, are guilty you, are you, are and you, are responsible you for murder are, because are I am presenting a point of view are you that is contradictory are you a to are you an authoritarian a point of view that you have that I must follow your orders, I must follow your guidelines, otherwise I'm a murderer. I want to be Listen, very no, clear. You're, you're I saying that no one... I, that, I'm not saying... And I I'm not saying back on that in the strongest possible terms. You have absolutely no right to call me a murderer because I'm exercising my word. first amendment rights and because I'm standing up for working people in the United States of America. How dare you? Do not say that my, to me. My issue, my issue is you're using a very 
specific example. This is just information based on you, one individual, and you're trying to use that to tell people, hey, I'm not sick, so you can go out. Are you a person over the age of 65? Where were you? Do you well, have, tens of thousands you have, of people are you dying every year of the flu. Hey, Brandon, Where I let you, you talk. I let you talk. I let you talk. You Do you have a pre-existing condition? Do you have asthma? Do you have diabetes? You said you're a completely healthy person. Yeah, that's not going to affect you as much as it's going to affect someone who has these issues that you're coming into contact with. You wear a mask. You stay six feet away from people. You take the precautions. You know, a lot of these states are saying you can go out and do these things now. Guys, I, but, I, I think you're going to have a difference of opinion here that will not be settled on this show. Thank you very much for that very lively debate. And thank you at home for watching. Remember, you can see this show and all our previous episodes on our channel on YouTube. Until next week then, goodbye.